Okay, let's get started. So first of all, regarding your second midterm, so many of you got 100, two of you got 105, which means your figures, those two are the figures I thought were publication quality that would go into a journal. They were good enough for that. You put in a lot of effort. What does extra five points mean? It means that if you're, you know, it will help you. Like if you're, if you're hanging between two grades and that's the same applies to your bonus points in the previous homeworks. There will also be a bonus problem on the final exam. Try it. I find third of the students never even touch the bonus problem thinking it's too hard. No, try it. You might get bonus points. You might end up scoring more than 100, which means it can make up for your remaining exams or homeworks, or it might just raise your score. So two of you got 105, many of you got 100, and the remaining are spread between 90, 95, 98, 100, something like that. Those of you who got 90, the number one reason is, I repeated and repeated and repeated, please don't use more than two pages. But some of you did use three pages. So you get 90 points. I mean, come on, I was fair, right? I repeated it many, many times because this is something, it's not just me being mean, you will apply for a fellowship application or things like that. National Science Foundation, for example, you can apply for a million dollar grant with a 10 page limit and you will submit it. And six months later, they will tell you, oh, your grant was not selected because you exceeded the page limit. And for six months, you are waiting to hear on a million dollar grant, which is going to support your PhD students and everything. Page limits matter, please respect them. Some of you had figures, which were not really figures. They were entirely text. That's, that's not a figure, okay? I've given a lot of leeway and some of you got 98, which is just aesthetic. So 100 means everything was to the point. Your figure was actually conveyed the message of the paper and yeah. And so, but everyone has done well, which was the point of this. You all put in the good effort, especially in the presentation. So, and then, and the final, as I mentioned, will have 50% repeated homework problems. What does that mean? The solutions are there, they are online. You could just go and copy, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But even then I'm ready to bet some of you will make, make a mistake. So better, if you better copy, just because a solution is there, Connor might have made a mistake in the solution, okay? So if I grade it and Connor made a mistake and you copied it from the solution, I'm not guaranteed to give you full part. You cannot come and say, but that wasn't the solution because I'm gonna grade the finals. So don't just copy, make sure you understand what's going on. 25% of the problems will be things that I have mentioned. This is important, pay attention. I'm gonna ask it, so I will ask it. Remaining 25% will be something interesting that you will have to think and connect the dots over the semester and try to work through the problem. And there will be at least one bonus problem worth, worth 10 points. And uh, so I have this open because, so you got your midterms, Today and Wednesday, we are going to study kinetics. This is not going to be on the final exam. On Wednesday, if I finish early with kinetics, which is possible, I will, I will start a semester recap on Wednesday itself, which is fair to those of you who are attending. And Friday will be full semester recap. I will completely join the big, big picture, things that you should remember. Course evaluations are open. You should have received an email. Otherwise, just go and Google course evaluation. Please fill them up. So far, only seven out of 61 students have submitted. I normally get a rate of 90%, which is 55 students actually submitted. It's very important for a variety of reasons. It helps me improve as a teacher. It, uh, it also helps with my promotion and things like that. I already went up for tenure, so I'm gonna be a senior professor next year, I think. But when I go for full professor and things like that, they go, my document, my tenure package is a 200 page document which includes every single comment written by every one of you. It goes in it, they see how, how, how I did. So it's very important for my evolution as a teacher and my survival in science that you please submit your feedback. Okay, so please take your time to do that. Scores eval UMD, it will not take more than five minutes. And yeah, that's like noise. Final exam will be released morning of 13 December Monday. You will get an email or Slack message. And if, if you have seen Office, you will get a woof. Does anyone get that joke? Ryan, no, you won't get a woof. You will just, you'll just get a Slack message and uh, email. And uh, you will have a week for it. It will be due the following Monday. And it's open internet. If you can find something on the internet, just go ahead, but do it at your own risk, okay? So you can use notes, whatever you want. You just can't go and post, especially for the newer problems, which are which do not exist out there, which I will be making on myself. 
I do not want to see them having been posted on Chegg or anything like that. I, I can find when you do that, okay? So please don't post anything. That will, it's, yeah. So no discussion with someone on the internet, no discussion within yourselves. And that's, that's the final exam. You can all do well. I hope to give a lot of A's. Please, that's my dream. Please help me make my dream come true, okay? Aim, try to do the bonus problem also. Try to do all problems, work through it. You've got a lot of time to work through it. And it's take home. Many of you gave me feedback that take home exams help you feel less stressed. And I agree that is, that is, that is really exciting. So, okay. Any questions about anything? Okay. So let's start with uh, kinetics. This, either I have become taller or this table has gone lower. I think the table has gone lower. I'm not gonna risk it. I just sit on a chair. So, so far, how did all of our thermodynamics this semester evolve, right? What was the first thing we talked about? We talked about delta U is equal to delta Q plus delta W. And we said any process in which the change of internal energy is the sum of heat given to the system plus work done on the system is allowed. But then we realized this does not distinguish between backward processes and forward processes, right? Then we led to the concept of entropy, which said that if the entropy change, anyone remembers? How do we write down the condition for spontaneity in terms of entropy? Go ahead. For an isolated system, for a non-isolated system? For, uh, for what you said is for an isolated system, right? For system plus surrounding. How about, how about a system which, on which, to which some heat is being given? Clausius inequality, go ahead. Delta Q over T, right? This should be true. And then this led us to the concept of that if it's a constant temperature pressure process, the DG should be negative. If it's a constant temperature, uh, uh, temperature volume process, then dA should be negative, right? So this allowed us to talk about spontaneous processes. So the problem with this, it's, it's useful. It tells us when things will happen. However, so far we are missing something critical, which is time, when will it happen? So let's consider an uh, example. So, so, so far, the big picture here is that thermo so far has allowed us to check if a process, and by a process, I mean a reaction is spontaneous, reversible, non-spontaneous, etc. These three are the possibilities, right? It also allowed us to talk about the equilibrium constant, right? It also allowed us to talk about things such as PB by PA at equilibrium. What is the ratio of two things that exist once equilibrium is reached and things balance out? How does equilibrium change as a function of temperature and pressure? But what is really missing so far is time. And we have to keep in mind that spontaneous is not equal to instantaneous. Just because something spontaneous, just because something is spontaneous does not mean it will happen right away. In fact, it might take age of the universe for it to happen. Thermodynamics does not tell us when it will happen. It just tells us if you wait long enough, it will happen. That can be useful, but not always, right? If you're, if, 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 if you're doing an undergrad research project, it might be way longer than the four years you have as an undergrad. So now we will, and so the key point here is that reactions take time, right? And we want to develop some machinery in order to study how much time do they take? How do we calculate it? So this is most times in 481, this is not taught, but I think it's important that you all get a picture for this and it's useful. You will find it being used all the time and, and you can go and read more on it. Again, this part is not on the exam. So we will develop, we will look at two types of reactions. We will classify reactions broadly into two types. A general reaction is a combination of both of these, okay? So the, and I will draw a line here. The first type of reaction we are going to look at is what I'm going to call an activated barrier 
crossing. And I will explain what exactly that means. So the point here is, let's say you have some reactant A and some product B. And this over here is the free energy. And this over here is possible progress of reaction. Okay, some progress coordinate. So as per this picture, and this is happening at let's say constant temperature and pressure. Okay, you can generalize the concepts to other conditions also. So this shows that the free energy, Gibbs free energy of B is lower than Gibbs free energy of A, right? So as per this, it looks like B should form, right? You should just go to B. Now, an example for this could be, and you know, this, this could, for example, be A and C existing separately forming B. Okay, so an example for this could be H2 plus N2 gas forming ammonia. Okay, so no, I haven't balanced your reaction in a long time. 3H2 plus N2 gas going through and through, right? A, 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 a more, um, uh, I don't know if this is spontaneous or not. Is it spontaneous? I think you need to apply some temperature or pressure. Or but let's consider some other reaction, which is carbonic acid. H2CO3 aqueous going to H2O gas plus CO2 gas. This, this we know is spontaneous, right? This normally happens. It's like the concept behind soft drinks and things like that. So, so my point is, if the free energy of the product is lower than the free energy of the reactant, just by looking at this, we cannot tell how much time will the reaction take to occur, right? Why is that the case? The reason that is the case, in order for this to happen, A and C typically need to get together. Some bonds need to break, some bonds need to form. They are happy in their little spot. They are, they are very happy doing whatever they are doing. And they might get happier doing something else, but there's a barrier that they have to overcome, right? This morning you were sleeping, it was wonderful. You had a great weekend. Now you are here in class, it's wonderful. Your brains are gaining so much more knowledge. Your free energy is lower, I think, right? Currently compared to when you were in the bed, but you had a barrier. You have to get up, you have to dress up, you have to come to class, right? And you overcame that barrier. Now your free energy is hopefully lower. So what that looks like is something like, this, you have a local minima corresponding to when the reactants exist. It could be A plus C together or just A separately something, you know? So this corresponds to reactants and this corresponds to products. And there is a barrier that you need to cross in order to go to the product. And higher is this barrier, more will be the time taken by the reaction to occur. And we are going to look, how can we talk about the time taken by the reaction in terms of the height of this barrier? So this is the first type of rare event, uh, first type of reaction we will talk about. The second type of reaction we will talk about does not really have a barrier, yet it takes time. The second type of reaction I will talk about is, we will talk about is diffusion controlled reaction. And generally reactions are a combination of both of these. They don't occur in isolation. What do I mean by diffusion control reaction? Let's say I have a beaker, okay, of water. And I'm looking at the beaker from top. Okay, this is the top view of the beaker. beaker. Do you have a question? Okay. And uh, in this beaker, I drop a little drop of ink right in the middle. Okay, a dense drop of ink. This is, this is all water in the background and I let it sit, how do you think it will look like after a while? Huh? Any ideas? What should happen to the ink, go ahead. It will spread, right? The ink will spread around. It will start to look something like this. It might not be spherical. It might be, I don't know, but it will spread. At some point, it will just dissolve uniformly. And we studied using phase diagrams as to whether it will dissolve uniformly or whether it will have two phases, you know, we know all that. But if you have ever done something like this, you know it takes time, right? It does not happen instantaneously. So in this case, let's call this GA and let's call this GB. Which one is going to have lower free energy, A or B? 
You have already answered. Anyone else? Go ahead. Why? Well, you intuitively expect it will have lower free energy, right? But you have to calculate. If you assume the bonds are the same, then the entropy has gone up. That's the simplest reason, right? So B is going to have lower free energy than A, but clearly it takes time for this to happen, right? It does not spread instantaneously. So my question for you is, if I assume this is a sphere or a, not a sphere, but a circle, which is spreading, let's say on the surface, and I have the radius of this thing as R, R will depend on time, right? At T is equal to zero, R is zero. As T increases, R increases. Does anyone have a guess as to how should R depend on time? You have already answered someone else, or I will come back to you. Hannah has already answered. Anyone else from the back? It should increase with time, right? We agree on that. But it's hard to see how exactly should it increase on time, right? It might increase as t squared. It might increase simply as r proportional to time, right? It could be anything. Yeah, you have a guess? No, that doesn't help. The, the answer here is radius is proportional to square root of time. And this is really fundamental. This square root of time dependence shows up everywhere. Stock market, weather patterns, how birds move. It's just everywhere. If you don't have an energy barrier, this is purely for diffusion control things. If you have an energy barrier, you have to mix both, the, both those things. And we won't be talking about that. So, But I will show you why does this square root of time come from? In those of you who like probability and statistics, it, it's also, there is a physical example for this, which is known as the drunk gambler problem. Imagine, where do undergrads go to drink? Where? Okay, okay. Well, there are some terrible bars around here. I mean, I'm sorry. You know, cornerstone, yeah, it's just terrible. Or what's the other one called? Loonies, yeah, there you go. And in front of Looney, there is a liquor store, right? It's just, it's just, when nothing is open, you go to that one. So let's say, and I wanna talk a little bit about diffusion control, then I will go back to activated barrier and talk about it a bit more. So let's say you are someone who has had a bunch to drink. Okay, and uh, you are not really thinking hard. So this is your dorm or wherever you stay. And you have had so much to drink that you are not thinking hard enough, right? So you will move once in a while in this direction. And once in a while you will move back in this direction, right? So this is what we call a drunk, and people it's call, let's just call it a drunken walk. I don't want to enthuse the gambler thing in this. So you have a drunken walk where, and it's only 1D motion, right? And you're moving back and forth in X. And uh, let's, let's actually do the diffusion one first. And then we will go back to activated barrier crossing once we have done diffusion. So we will start with this one and then come back to this. So, and let's say it's all flat. There are no hills, okay? You are just, it's a flat road, there is no traffic. So if I ask you about your, and this is zero, okay? This is negative and this is positive X. So if I, and, uh, and uh, this is you after a few drinks, okay? What is going to be your average X coordinate as of at any point of time? Corinna, what do you think? So you can go either way. You can go left, you can go right with equal probability. Zero, wherever you started, right? You go left, sometimes you go right, sometimes you will go far left, but then you will start going back right. So on an average, it will be zero, right? The question is, if I observe you as a function of time, you will tend to go more and more right? You might be coming back, but you will be spreading more and more. So the variance will actually be proportional to time. And this is what you can prove using something called stochastic processes or just probability theory. You can calculate this and see that. So on an average, if I just calculate the average of where you are, you are going to be over here. 
But as time progresses, at short time, I will find that you have basically gone. It's, it's, let, let's imagine it this way. You are drunk and you have a lot of, I don't know, uh, cookies in your backpack, right? So wherever you go, you're dropping some cookies, right? So as a function of time, I see how, much, how many cookies have you dropped. So for small time, I will see you have dropped cookies in this area. The center of the cookies would always be zero. As I go to longer times, I'll find that you have dropped cookies in this area, right? You have more and more. And this thing will increase. This, this length, this length will increase as a square root of time. And this applies to drunk people who are walking randomly. This also applies to ink droplets, which are diffusing. It applies to diffusion in general. This is the fundamental. And the person who really thought of this for the first time was Einstein. He really quantified these things in early 20th century. People had thought about this before, but that this is, so uh, there is a theorem for this called Einstein-Stokes law, and you can go and read of all that. So let's look at this systematically. So in order to look at this systematically, we are going to, so what are we trying to do here? We are trying to study, develop some sort of a model for the problem of diffusion, which is when there is no barrier, entropically, we know things will spread out. We want to study how much time will this tend to spread out? How much time does it take for all that? Once we finish diffusion, next class, we will talk about barrier crossing and transition state theory. So diffusion, let's set up a problem where I have a container and this container has two partitions, okay? And inside this container, inside these partitions, I have a lot of random gas molecules, okay? So then I remove these partitions and let it sit for a while. So what I will find, as you can expect, is that these gas molecules will diffuse everywhere, right? And uh, if you let it sit long enough, it will diffuse and fill up the box completely uniformly. So let's call this direction as an X axis because nothing much interesting is happening in Y or Z. And let's call this one as X is equal to zero. So when you started, imagine the partition was very tight. Everything was very, very tightly focused along X is equal to zero. So if I now ask you, to plot the concentration. So these are gas molecules. If I ask you to plot the concentration of gas molecules as a function of time, at a very, very small time, it's going to look like what is known as a delta function, okay? It will be very tight, given that these partitions are very close to each other, right? So this is C of X as a function of time, okay? Concentration, concentration, as function of time and position, okay? So C of X comma zero, concentration as a function of X at zero time is going to look almost like a delta function, depending on how close your partitions were. As time progresses, it's going to spread and it's going to look more and more like this. So notice what happened. In this first, when time was equal to zero, where did we have high concentration? We had high concentration over here and we had low concentration over here, right? We also had low concentration over here. T is equal to zero. So what just happened? Mass moved from the region of high concentration to the region of low concentration, right? So mass or matter moves from region of high concentration to low concentration. This is in the absence of any other potential. You could try to apply the same thing to money, for example, right? Would money move from richer people to poorer people? It doesn't happen. Normally it goes the other way, right? Because there are other driving forces that are existing in the system. This is if you have no other driving force, matter moves from region of high concentration to low concentration. 
Fick's law quantifies this statement. So let me draw the plot once again, and then I will talk about Fick's law of diffusion. So the plot that I drew looked something like this. At x is equal to zero, at t is equal to zero, we have c of x comma zero. And as time progresses, it leads to something that looks like this. And I said, this was high concentration at t equal to zero. And this is low concentration at t is equal to zero. So fix law, fix was some scientist long ago, fix law of diffusion, specifically the first law says that flux is proportional to gradient of concentration. So it looks like I introduced a bunch of mathy terms, but it's really quite simple. It's saying matter will move in the, in the direction of high concentration to low concentration. Matter will move from where, where you have high concentration to a part where you don't have high concentration. So how do we quantify change in concentration? We will look at change in C divided by change in X, right? And why did I write a partial? Because we, we, C is also a function of time, right? So I'm, I can't really just write D. I have to deal with partials. And the flux, flux is how you measure how much something has moved. This is called flux. The unit of flux is kilogram per meter cube per second. So mass divided by volume, how much density is being exported per unit time, right? Kilogram per meter cube is the unit of density, right? So density per unit time is flux or density divided by time. So Fick's first law says that flux is going to be proportional to the gradient of concentration. Now let's try to do better. Should it be proportional to plus gradient of concentration or minus gradient of concentration? Over here, should I have a plus sign or a minus sign? If you think about it, when you went from here to here, the two lines that I drew, what is delta C? Delta C is negative, right? Delta C is negative. What is delta X? Positive, right? You went from, yeah, who said positive? Yeah, she's absolutely, you're Katya, right? Yeah. Katya is absolutely correct because we are thinking about final minus initial, right? So final concentration is low, initial concentration was high. So this concentration minus this concentration is negative while the x coordinate of this point minus x coordinate of this point is positive, right? So now if you think about delta C by delta x, that is negative. But we expect that flux moves in that direction, right? Flux we expect to be positive. That's why we need to have a minus sign over here. And this proportionality constant has a name. It is known as the diffusion constant. So you can do the math. I already told you flux has unit of kilogram meter cube per second. Concentration has unit of kilogram per meter cube. So you can do the math and see that diffusion will have units of meter square per second. If you're paying attention, you might see why that square root of time thing might be about to pop up, right? It's meter square by second, distance squared divided by time. Any, any questions about this? Anyone confused? Okay, so this is Fick's first law. It says flux is proportional to gradient of concentration with a minus sign. You go from high concentration to low concentration. If you're moving from low concentration to high concentration, you would have a plus sign, but that's not what happens. You can generalize it to multiple dimensions. You can write it as J is equal to minus D gradient of C. This applies to two dimensions, three dimensions. The funny thing about two or three dimensions is the diffusion becomes a tensor. 
it's not even a scalar, it's a matrix where, yeah, it, it tensor in higher dimensions. We will not go there. You can see why it might be a tensor. If you have a crystal, different directions can have different propensities for movement, right? You might have movement happening in one direction. For those of you who, do are, bio, bi, who are doing biochemistry, if you have a membrane, motion might happen, or let's just take my hand, for example, right? Flux is going to move in the direction of my hand. It's not, you don't have stuff popping outside my hand, right? So clearly it's an isotropic. So you can imagine why diffusion might be another topic in higher dimensions. So this is Fick's first law. Let me write it down once again. Page number two, page number three, page number four. So Fick's first law says J is equal to minus D gradient of C or in one dimension, J is equal to minus D partial C by partial X where C is a function of X comma time. So we, we are there, but we still, we are seeing time showing up now, right? For the first time, we are explicitly talking about something that depends on time, but we are not quite there yet. We have to think a bit more. And if I call something as fixed first law, you can imagine this fixed second law is also probably coming, right? There is no fixed third law, there is only second law. So let's talk about fixed second law and then our time idea will become clear. And I really, really like fixed second law. In fact, it's one of those things when I was an undergrad, when I first read about fixed second law, it somehow inspired me so much. I thought I want to be a scientist, which you might find strange. And it shows up everywhere. It shows up in quantum mechanics. It shows up in fluid mechanics. It's basic idea of fixed second law is continuity of mass. What do I mean by that? Let's draw a box. Okay, and let's call this one as the X direction of the box, okay? Let's say nothing is happening in Y and Z, just for the sake of simplicity. So we are going to consider these two surfaces of the box. And let's say this length is Delta X, okay? Now let's say you have flux J of X entering from the left side of this box, and flux J of X plus delta X entering from, leaving from the right side of the box. What, and remember the unit of flux, right? What was unit of flux? It was meter cube per kilogram per second. So per unit time, you have a certain density entering a box. And in the same unit time, you have a certain other density exclude getting out of the box something must be happening inside the box then, right? This change of density that you have must be staying inside the box. It has to go somewhere. It's not gonna go just like disappear out of it, right? So flux, fixed second law says that if you think about J of X plus Delta X minus J of X and divide it by Delta X, If this thing is positive, what does that mean? If this thing is positive, if the flux exiting, and pay attention now, if the flux exiting the box is more than the flux entering the box, what does it say what happened inside the box? Was something created or destroyed? You put in 10 and you got 12 out. So you took something out of the box, right? The flux went in, caught up with something else and then went out. So if you think about the change of concentration inside the box as a function of time, it is going to be equal to the rate of change of flux over unit distance, again, with a minus sign. And you can see why the minus sign makes sense. If J X plus Delta X is more than J of X, C inside box went down. The reason I like this so much is because when you study quantum mechanics, the most important equation is quantum mechanics is time dependent Schrodinger equation. It's like the most fundamental equation in life, in reality. That is nothing but this equation applied to probability density of the wave equation. That's all you are doing. So if you understand fixed second law, when you take 482, those of you who do it, you will hopefully develop an appreciation for time dependent Schrodinger equation. So in other words, we have just said that partial C by partial T is equal to minus 
dj by dx but think about our first law fix first law that says j is equal to minus d dc by partial c by partial x right and now we have this one if you put one in two what do you get put one in two you get partial c by partial t is equal to minus d second derivative of concentration with position and this is integrated or or people just i won't call it integrated this is called fix second law it really consumes fix first law in order to exist that partial c by partial t is equal to minus d partial square c by partial x square so mathemat i know mathematicians who spend their whole careers trying to think about this equation and how it can be solved in general conditions it becomes complicated for example if a diffusion depends on the position right then you cannot just take d out of the equation you have to put d inside the equation so it tells you that the if and and this box is just something you put in space right some diffusion is happening through this you imagine a little tiny box in the middle it's a fictional concept that you have introduced it's telling you that the rate of change of matter inside that box is related to the second derivative of the concentration inside that box to me this is not at all obvious but it follows quite nicely by two very simple concepts one is flux is proportional to gradient of concentration and second is continuity of mass right if you went in and less of you went out you must have gone inside the box of course some chemical reaction might have inside happened inside the box which now takes whatever went inside but that's another story right so combining these two we get this very useful equation where i made a typo anyone notices a typo yeah yeah this is the wave equation everything is the same you know this is my so the so the one one funny thing about me is i don't have a degree in chemistry you know my undergrad was metallurgy my phd was material science i did postdoc in switzerland and new york city in chemistry but i don't have a degree in chemistry why am i still teaching you pchem well because i like it but also because physical chemistry really transcends different subjects right wave equation quantum mechanics solid state physics it's it's all it's really builds comes into uh, builds into uh, uh, physical chemistry so yeah if you have done wave mechanics you will recognize this wave equation and that's why quantum mechanics is really about waves right go ahead yeah it's a plus sign <laughs> so this one is a plus sign right because we had a uh, minus over here and a minus over here right so if you combine these two it becomes a plus sign as your partial c by partial t is plus d partial square c by partial x square so this equation is super important and you can also generalize it to higher dimensional instead of double derivative you will have the laplacian and you can have fun with it and it 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 has kept mathematicians busy for 100 years okay they still you will still see hardcore mathematicians talking about general solutions to this equations whether it even exists or not we are going to talk about something simple okay so let me write down the equation once again which is partial and i will write down all variables here partial of c as a function of x and time with respect to time is equal to plus diffusion coefficient multiplied by partial double derivative of c with respect to x square so let's try to solve this equation how should we proceed anyone really believes they are good in partial derivatives and can help me solve this andrew is nodding his head no okay it's hard to solve but we are going to do a bit of cheating i will tell you the solution and then tell you that go and put it back in this equation and you will see it satisfies it okay and the solution actually is again inspired by wave equation the solution looks something like this so in physics when you don't know how to proceed and you kind of come up with a solution kind of by cheating or intuition or something like that you give it a fancy name that fancy name is called ansatz it's a german word okay it's, it's like an assumption and you can show that oh i think this should fit this equation and you put it and you find oh wow it does fit the equation okay it's a solution 
there was a very famous mathematician from India named Ramanujan who used to do everything by this. He would just get ideas in sleep. They were like, I don't know how to get it, but this is the answer to the problem. It's crazy. There is a movie about him called Man Who Knew Infinity, which is very cool. So my solution to this is C of X comma T is equal to square root of four pi DT e to the power minus X square divided by four DT. So this is DIY put five in four to see it is indeed a solution. So I'm not saying that there are no other solutions. I'm saying that if you put this one in this equation, you will get, you will find that it is true. You can differentiate both sides, it's not hard. Exponentials are remarkably nice to differentiate, right? Because they just stay exponentials. Terms keep coming up as prefactors. So do it for yourself and see how it looks. However, now we can plot this function and see how it looks. And that's the real interesting part. So So I'm going to plot it as a function of x for different times. I will plot it first as at x time equal to zero. In equation five, if time becomes very small, how will the curve look like? If time goes to zero, this curve looks like a delta function. It will become sharper and sharper as you go to smaller and smaller times. C x zero resembles a delta function, which is what we started with, right? We said that everything is right in the middle of the box, right? So I'm just showing you that it follows what you had expected intuitively. Now, I make time go bigger. This is an exponential. How, what do exponentials do? They decay, right? In, in case of, if, if, you, if you have been following the news, the term exponential has showed up in the news so many times due to COVID, right? Exponential rate and things like that. So if you have e to the powers minus something, it's going to decay. Is this an even function or an odd function of x? It's an even function, right? So the behavior will be symmetric for positive x and for negative x. So as time goes up, it's going to look like this. It will decay more and more, okay? So this is as time increases, C of x comma t spreads. So now we can calculate two things. We can calculate the average value of x. In order to calculate the average value of x, you can see it visually, right? It's spreading evenly, right? So you expect the average value of x to be zero. Mathematically, how will that look like? We are going to do integral dx x multiplied by c of x comma t divided by integral dx c of x comma t. So we are treating c of x comma t as a probability. And now c of x comma t is an even function, right? And we are integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity. This one is also going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So in the, uh -oh. In the numerator, we have an even function multiplied by an odd function, right? X is odd. What is even multiplied by odd? It's an odd function. So the numerator here is going to be zero divided by something which is non-zero. I don't care what is the integral of C of X comma T. If you do this one, you will find that the integral is one, but it doesn't matter. It is something non-zero. So the average value of X is going to be zero. But my question now is, can I calculate this, this thing, the spread of this function as it spreads out, right? So for very, very small time, the spread is small. As the time increases, 
this spread increases. So I can quantify it, this spread as the variance of x, okay? That is, since average x is zero, the variance is just average of x square. That is going to be integral dx x square c of xt divided by integral dx c of xt. Now we have an even function. We have another even function. This is not going to be zero. Do it yourself. So this was DIY one. This is DIY two. If you do this yourself, you will find this is something proportional to square root of time. It just falls out. Sorry, I wrote it wrong. The, the X square is proportional to time. The variance is proportional to time. Therefore, standard deviation, which is square root of the variance is proportional to square root of time. And you will see the diffusivity is the proportionality factor over here. And the square root of time dependence shows up in so many domains of science and engineering. If there is no driving potential, next time we will, next class we will talk about what happens if you have to cross over a barrier. We will not, we will not really worry about this diffusion. It will show up as a prefactor. But next time we will, we have, so today we have done diffusion. I showed you fixed first law and fixed second law. Next time we will talk about what is the time taken to go over a barrier. We will talk about transition state theory, which has led to at least one Nobel Prize, and there might be more. And uh, I don't think we will finish before the end of the class. But if we do, actually, we will just do kinetics next time. If you don't want to come, that's fine. If you, I hope you do. And we will do a full recap of the semester on Friday. And again, please fill up the course evaluations whenever you get a time. I think it finishes this Friday, so you have to submit it before. Saturday or Friday.